Good evening, everyone. Welcome to Midtown Scholar Bookstore. My name is Jill. Thank you for joining us this evening. We're happy you're here. We hope you feel safe and we hope you enjoy tonight's program with Viet Thanh Nguyen. A quick couple of notes and a plug before we begin. We have many copies of Viet's book this evening from the sympathizer and committed to Chicken of the Sea and the Refugees. We encourage you to come away with a book tonight. Every purchase helps the bookstore, the author, and this event series. And we will be having a book signing immediately following the event. While our speakers this evening will not wear masks on stage, we ask that you please continue wearing masks during the event, during the Q&A, and during the signing. And lastly, I have one important plug that I'd like to make, and that is that next Friday, Harrisburg is hosting its first ever Asian American Pacific Islander Heritage event. It's celebrating, it's taking place right here in Midtown on Friday, May 20th. There's going to be a kickoff ceremony at the Broad Street Market at 5.30, then a film screening of Spirited Away over at the cinema later in the evening, and we will be hosting debut novelist Ellen Shea Chow at 7 p.m. for her book, Disorientation, which has been called the funniest, most poignant novel of the year by Vogue. Sorry. <laughs> Harrisburg's AAPI group has put a lot of hard work and effort into making this happen. And we really want to make a splash for the community. So please consider signing up for the book talk, sharing the details with friends and family, and joining us at the bookstore next Friday. All events are free and open to the public, and I have flyers up at the cafe, so please take one and spread the word. But now on to tonight's program. Sheila Jen Menon is assistant professor at English at Dickinson College. Her research centers on questions of race and identity in Malaysian literature and culture, and is informed by her upbringing in Malaysia, Singapore, and Honolulu. Her work has been published in Ariel, Burge, The Diplomat, The Conversation, and New Mandala. In the classroom, Sheila Jane teaches Asian American postcolonial and world literature. She was appointed in the Pennsylvania Governor's Advisory Committee on Asian Pacific American Affairs in December 2019. Viet Thanh Nguyen was born in Vietnam and raised in America. He's the author of The Sympathizer, which was awarded the 2016 Pulitzer Prize in Fiction, The Committed, as well as The Refugees, Nothing Ever Dies, Chicken of the Sea, and The Displaced. He is a university professor and the Ariel Award Professor of English and American and Ethnicity at the University of Southern California, and is a recipient of fellowships at the Guggenheim and MacArthur Foundations. He lives in Los Angeles. It is a true honor to welcome Viet back to Harrisburg, so please join me in giving him a warm Harrisburg welcome. Hello, Harrisburg. It's good to be back. Wow. Um, I came in uh, 1975, I believe in the summer of 1975. I was four years old, hence my imprecision. But uh, my family and I were uh, Viet are Vietnamese people, and we happened to be on the losing side of the war in Vietnam. So we fled along with 130,000 or so other Vietnamese refugees. Um, we had a very dramatic escape story, which I won't bore you with. But we arrived here uh, in Fort Indian Town Gap sometime in the summer of 1975. And this is where my memories begin um, as a refugee in Fort Indian Town Gap. And uh, it was, as you could imagine, kind of a traumatic experience. Um, but it wasn't all bad because being a refugee gave me the requisite emotional damage necessary to become a writer. Uh, and so a lot of that damage is manifested in the fiction hopefully in a humorous way as well, as, as you'll see tonight. I think I'm probably best known for a book called The Sympathizer. And if you haven't read The Sympathizer yet, shame on you. Uh, I just did find out recently that HBO is going to turn The Sympathizer into a TV series. Oh, oh, you applauded that, okay. Yes, that means that if you haven't read The Sympathizer, you never have to read The Sympathizer. You can just watch the TV series, all right? Um, but The Sympathizer, okay, what you have to know about The Sympathizer, it's, uh, it's a novel about a, a mixed race, French and Vietnamese communist spy. And when Saigon falls or is liberated, depending on your point of view, his mission is to flee with the remnants of that army to the United States and spy on their efforts to take their country back. And a lot of this is based on, on real things that happened in Vietnamese and American history and you should read the book. I'm gonna be looking at the sequel of the book, which is called The Committed. So if I'll give a little bit away at the end of The Sympathizer. Our sympathizer does live and he finds himself on a boat fleeing from Vietnam yet again. And when the book was published, I think a significant portion of readers thought that when you get on a boat, fleeing from a communist country like Vietnam, there is only one possible destination. 
the United States of America, land of the Happy Meal. Well, if you've actually read The Sympathizer, you know that that's not what's gonna happen. So in The Committed, I take him to France, to Paris, the land of his father, um, because I wanted to have fun with the French. You know, when I, when I wrote The Sympathizer, I set out to try to offend everybody. I succeeded, judging from my hate mail. Um, I get a lot of hate mail from Americans saying, love it or leave it. And if you, if you, you know, if you hate America that much, why don't you just go back to Vietnam since you love communism so much? Which means they never read the end of the novel because if you read the end of the novel as apparently the Vietnamese Communist Party has done, that's why they don't let the novel get published in Vietnam, you know? Um, and in fact, you know, we're trying to get permission to shoot The Sympathizer as a TV series. And of course, I would love to have it shot in Vietnam. And a few weeks ago, we got the, the, the uh, response from the, the, uh, the ministry in charge of this kind of stuff saying, sorry, can't do it because you don't put the revolutionary soldier in a positive light. However, if you want to shoot a movie like Kong Island in Vietnam, that's awesome. Come and do more of that kind of stuff. That's a positive representation of Vietnam, but not the complexities that you see in The Sympathizer. So anyway, uh, also the South Vietnamese and Vietnamese refugees don't like the book either because they're deeply anti-communist. And when they saw that this book is from the perspective of a communist spy, they're like, we just cannot possibly read this book. Even though the whole point of the book is to get past these kinds of Cold War, either or, good or evil kinds of oppositions. So who else was there enough to offend? The French, that's where we're going. But we're gonna start off uh, on this refugee boat. This is the opening prologue of the committed. We're gonna start off on this refugee boat as these people are fleeing the country. We, the unwanted, wanted so much. We wanted food, water, and parasols, although umbrellas would be fine. We wanted clean clothes, baths, and toilets, even of the squatting kind since squatting on land was safer and less embarrassing than clinging to the bulwark of a rolling boat with one's posterior hanging over the edge. We wanted rain, clouds, and dolphins. We wanted it to be cooler during the hot day and warmer during the freezing night. We wanted an estimated time of arrival. We wanted not to be dead on arrival. We wanted to be rescued from being barbecued by the unrelenting sun. We wanted television, movies, music, anything with which to pass the time. We wanted love, peace, and justice, except for our enemies, whom we wanted to burn in hell, preferably for eternity. We wanted independence and freedom, except for the communists, who should all be sent to re-education, preferably for life. We wanted benevolent leaders who represented the people by which we met us and not them, whoever they were. We wanted to live in a society of equality, Although if we had to settle for owning more than our neighbor, that would be fine. We wanted a revolution that would overturn the revolution we had just lived through. In sum, we wanted to want for nothing. What we most certainly did not want was a storm, and yet that was what we got on the seventh day. The faithful once more cried out, God help us. The non-faithful cried out, God, you bastard. Faithful or unfaithful, there was no way to avoid the storm dominating the horizon and surging closer and closer. Whipped into a frenzy, the wind gained momentum, and as the waves grew, our ark gained speed and altitude. Lightning illuminated the dark furrows of the storm clouds, and thunder overwhelmed our collective groan. A torrent of rain exploded on us, and as the waves propelled our vessel ever higher, the faithful prayed and the unfaithful cursed, but both wept. Then our ark reached its peak, and for an eternal moment, perched on the snow-capped crest of a watery precipice. Looking down on that deep wine-colored valley awaiting us, we were certain of two things. The first was that we were absolutely going to die, and the second was that we would almost certainly live. Yes, we were sure of it. We will live. And then we plunged, howling, into the abyss. So that's the opening. Um, some of you may remember that in the late 1970s and early 1980s, tens of thousands of Vietnamese people fled from Vietnam on these boats, uh, typically fishing boats not meant for the open sea. And the Western media coined a term to describe these people, the boat people. And, you know, the French, <laughs> 
<laughs> they don't like to borrow English words for French. But you know what they call the boat people in French? Les boat people. I find that deeply problematic because I don't know what you think of when you hear the term boat people, but I see these pictures of overcrowded boats, desperate people. I have, you know, the images for me of boat people are desperate, pathetic, frightened people. And of course they were pathetic and frightened. If you were on a overloaded fishing boat on the open sea, you'd be pretty frightened and pathetic too. But about half of the people who got on these boats never made it to their destination. We don't know precisely how many people didn't make it. But a lot of these people knew that their odds were really, really bad. So I don't think of them as pathetic. I think of them as heroic. Now, Christopher Columbus and the Pilgrims, they were boat people, okay? So he gets to Paris and he makes some bad choices because he's been deeply traumatized by everything that's happened to him in the sympathizer. And here's what he does. Was I actually becoming that most horrid of criminals? No, not a drug dealer, which was a matter of bad taste. I mean, was I becoming a capitalist, which was a matter of bad morals, especially as the capitalist, unlike the drug dealer, would never recognize his bad morality or at least admit to it. A drug dealer was just a petty criminal who targeted individuals. And while he may or may not be ashamed of it, he usually recognized the illegality of his trade. But a capitalist was a legalized criminal who targeted thousands, if not millions, and felt no shame for his plunder. So what happens is, you know, he and his best friend, blood brother Bon, uh, fall in, uh, get, get a job with this, this ethnic Chinese Vietnamese crime boss called imaginatively the boss. And they do drugs, they deal drugs and all that kind of stuff. There's a lot of violence that takes place, a lot of, um, you know, gunfights and knife fights and things like this. I think one review in French that I like described this novel as a cross between Jean-Paul Sartre and Quentin Tarantino. And I like that description. There is a lot of ideas circulating in this book as well. And I am just gonna to turn to one last section where he, our narrator, who is, uh, who, who is unnamed in The Sympathizer, but in this book goes by the name of Vo Yang, does anybody know what Vo Yang means? I think I see one or two Vietnamese people in the crowd. New Vietnam, huh? No? Okay, then work? Okay. All right. So, oh, okay. Vo Yang, what does it mean? What's that? Go fast? No, it does not mean go fast. Di Yang, Di Di Mao. Let's go fast. No, Vo Yang, uh, if you go to Vietnam, as I've done, and you tour the battlefields and cemeteries, which I have done, very depressing. But the cemeteries are full of gravestones marked Bo Yang. It literally means nameless, anonymous, the unknown soldier, all right? So it's this joke on the French. It's also this joke on himself that he doesn't realize that his passport says Bo Yang, okay? And um, he is, like me, mentally colonized. So on the one hand, if you read The Sympathizer and you read this book, he's, he's got an opinion about everything. And he, he may have recognized that communism is a failed revolution, but he still believes in revolution and he's still deeply anti-capitalist. So he has an opinion about everything, very critical, very radical kind of a person, but he's mentally colonized, as am I. And so this book is partly about uh, dealing with the legacies of colonization, both recognizing that it actually happened and also then dealing with the consequences, including the mental traces that colonization has left in us. So for the Vietnamese people, for example, you know, some of us fought a revolution to overthrow the French, but all of us love French food, right? And I don't know how many of you have been to Paris or France or whatever, but you know, they've had the baguette and everything and they have, you can get a French sandwich made from a baguette. The Vietnamese have the bánh mì, which is better than any French sandwich you will ever have, okay? So we've been colonized, but we have taken the remnants and the relics of colonization, and we have tried to build something new out of it. So it's still a complicated relationship. And in this last passage, uh, our narrator is going to reflect on the impact of colonization on the Vietnamese. I suddenly recalled a professor at the Lycée, he went to this Lycée in Saigon, who had earned his degree in Paris in the 1930s. We students worshiped and envied him. Worship and envy pervaded our steamy colony as they do any colony. Colonizers imagine themselves as divine and the native middlemen who served them, like my professor, fancied themselves as priests and disciples. Not surprisingly, the colonizers looked down on us as savages 
infants or sheep, while we looked up to them as demigods, masters, or brutes. The danger with worshiping human beings, of course, is that eventually they reveal their flawed humanity, at which point the believer has no choice but to kill the fallen idols or die trying. Some of us love the French, our patrons, and some hated the French, our colonizers, but all of us had been seduced by them. It is difficult to be loved by someone, as the French imagined their relationship with us, or to be abused by someone, though the French pretended otherwise, without being shaped by their hand and touched by their tongue. Thus, we learn French literature and language under the tutelage of this professor who had actually stepped foot on the soil of La Gaule, our fatherland, as a scholarship student dispatched to absorb the best of French culture. He returned as a sopping wet sponge to us benighted natives, applying himself to foreheads that might be feverish with revolution. Ah, the Champs-Élysées, the sponge rhapsodized. Ah, the Eiffel Tower. And we all swooned just a little and dreamed that one day we, too, could board a steamer ship for the Metropole with nothing more than a suitcase, a scholarship, and an inferiority complex. Ah, Voltaire, the sponge effused. Oh, Descartes. Oh, Rousseau. In truth, we delighted in reading these masters in the original French for the sponge's classes, and we believed what the sponge told us that the greatest of literature and philosophy was universal and that French literature and philosophy was the greatest of the greatest. And by learning French literature and philosophy and language, we too could one day be Frenchmen. Although our lessons in the canon were complicated by our context of a colony. From Descartes, for example, I learned that because I think, therefore I am. But I also learned that in a world divided between the body and the mind, we Vietnamese were ruled by our bodies which was why the French could rule us with their minds. From Voltaire, I learned that it was best to tend to my own garden, which might mean many things, but when taught to us by the French, meant to mind our own business and be happy with our little plots, while the French took care of our entire colony and inflicted Candide-like horrors on us. As for Rousseau, perhaps I learned the most from him, for as I wrote my confession in the re-education camp, the beginning of Rousseau's own confession came back to me in a flash. I am resolved, he wrote, to an undertaking that has no model and will have no imitator. I want to show my fellow men a man in all the truth of nature, and this man is to be myself. Thank you, Jean-Jacques. By you, I was inspired to be true to myself, for even if myself was a rotten bastard, I was like no other rotten bastard in history before or since. I learned to love confessing and have never stopped acknowledging my crimes of violence, torture, and betrayal, all of which our French masters had taught us through the violence and torture they had inflicted on us as they betrayed their own ideals. These complicated lessons were only reinforced each time I left the hallowed grounds of the Lycée and walked the streets of Saigon with a French book under my arm, where, on occasion, I would be abused in the language of Dumas, Ostendo, or Balzac. Any Frenchman or woman or child, rich or poor, beautiful or plain, could call us anything he or she wanted and occasionally did. Yellow-skinned bastard, slanty-eyed chink. Some of us ignored the insults, wanting only for our masters to love us. Some of us could not forget the insults and wanted to slay our masters. And some of us, me and myself most of all, loved and hated our masters at the same time. Loving a master who kicks you is not a problem if that is all one feels, but loving and hating must be kept a dirty little secret. For loving the master one hates inevitably induces self-hatred. In confusion. That was why I never threw myself as wholeheartedly into the study of French as I did with English, and why, ever since leaving the Lycée, I had hardly ever spoken a word of French. French was the language of our enslaver and rapist, whereas English was a novelty, heralding an American arrival that spelled the end of our French debasement. I mastered English without ambivalence because it had never mastered us. Now in Paris at last, 
the land of my father, it suddenly struck me that I was not just seen as an other by white people. They also heard me as other. For when I opened my mouth and broke the beautiful China of their French language, they heard what the poet, boy wonder, gun runner, and slave trader Rambo must have heard and then plagiarized from some nameless African or Oriental traveler. I is an other. There was no need for the French to condemn us. So long as we spoke in their language, we condemned ourselves. Thank you, Harris Bird. Hi, Sheila. Hi, Viet. Thank you for, for that reading and those opening remarks. Um, and thank you for making time to be with us here today. I'm really excited for this conversation. It's almost ex exactly a year since we did this on Zoom for Midtown, also during AAPI Heritage Month. So it's great to continue that conversation um, and to welcome you back to Harrisburg in person. Um, thinking about the last passage that you ended with, I thought we could start by talking about the relationship between colonization and faith, and more specifically, colonization and Catholicism. Um, I noticed in the committed, maybe as much as or even more than in the sympathizer, uh, components of Catholic theology and ritual are often either a metaphor for colonial or patriarchal oppression, if not also the literal mechanisms, right, by which that manipulation happens. Could you talk to us about the political and narrative function of Catholicism and faith in the committed? Sure. I mean, I, I grew up a Vietnamese Catholic. Um, my parents are very devout, were very devout Vietnamese Catholics. And if you know anything about Vietnamese culture, it's very repressive and hierarchical. And if you know anything about Catholic culture, it's very repressive and hierarchical. <laughs> so to be a Vietnamese Catholic is to be very, very repressed and living in a constant state of shame and guilt. That was my, that was my personal experience. I don't know about... As a dissident Catholic myself, I... Oh, completely okay. understand. Yes, it's a universal <laughs> shared experience for some of us. And uh, when I was here in Harrisburg, I actually um, went to school at St. Margaret Mary. It's uh, not far away from here. I just drove by this afternoon to check out the site where uh, uh, at one point a nun grabbed me by my hair and shook me around because my, my this other kid and I were messing around during, uh, you know, mass or whatever. So anyway, I, I grew up deeply steeped in uh, Catholic theology Catholic symbolism, Catholic stories. Um, I, I, we went to church every week uh, and we went specifically to Vietnamese mass once we moved to San Jose where there were enough Vietnamese people to have a Vietnamese mass. Maybe it's changed, but I don't remember a Vietnamese mass uh, in Harrisburg. And I, I, I found it impossible to separate uh, all of these Catholic issues of faith from my parents, from the refugee existence and so on. And by that, I mean that my, I, my parents were really, really hardworking people, you know, and they really sacrificed themselves um, for my parent, my brother and myself and for all the relatives in Vietnam that my, my parents were sending money back to for years and years, because in the 70s and 80s, it was a really hard time in Vietnam. People needed that money just to live. And so I grew up, you know, on one hand, being taught about faith and sacrifice in the church and then watching my parents sacrifice themselves every day. And... Uh, the irony of it all is that my parents spent a lot of money sending me to Catholic school all the way through high school, and I turned out an atheist. Who knew, you know? Um, but the, the, what left an imprint on me was sacrifice. And what, I left, what left an imprint there, so what left an imprint on me was I read the Bible, okay? I read the Bible. I read the words of the Bible. And I was like, hey, Jesus Christ is actually kind of a, literally a kick-ass revolutionary dude who got murdered by, uh, who got betrayed by his own authorities and then murdered by the colonizers, Right? This is a narrative about revolution. Why, why am I being taught this in this other context of hierarchical institutional Catholicism, which I find totally repugnant and, and perplexing? And so ironically, what left an imprint on me was, I think, the word and not the, you know, the institution of the Catholic Church. And so I was, I was a reader. I, 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 I think I understand this book pretty clearly, you know, um, both its strengths and its weaknesses. 
And I also thought I understand very clearly the impact of this story on my own parents because they sacrificed themselves and they, they came close to death many times. And what I absorbed from them is that they were not hypocrites. So I may not have agreed with their faith, but they were never hypocrites. And so <laughs> they have left me with the gift and the curse of believing that I should be sacrificial myself, mm -hmm. you know, which means that I, they, didn't, they didn't want me to become a grocery store owner like they were, but they wanted me to work really, really hard, which is still true to this day. And, uh, you know, in my own capacity as a writer, um, I have deep faith in certain things like the faith in art, the faith in literature, the faith in language, the faith in the possibilities of social justice and redemption, the faith in a utopia that may never come, and the, and the faith that sacrifice can actually lead us in that direction. And so art is potentially that kind of a sacrifice for me, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and then how it works in, the, in these books is that it seemed to me that communism had a lot of the same beliefs, just with a different God, a different utopia, a different version of sacrifice, but, you know, just as much as the Catholics wanted to martyr themselves, the communists wanted to martyr themselves, too. Mm -hmm. And so my parents were born uh, about 30 minutes from where Ho Chi Minh was born. And this region is famous in Vietnam for being very poor uh, and the birthplace of either hardcore Catholics or hardcore communists. So it was basically a flip of the coin. What happened to my family? You know, we ended up on the Catholic side. But it felt, it felt to me that this is one of the reasons why the Catholics ended up on the other side of the war against the communists, because these are symmetrical versions of faith that are just mirror images of each other. And so that kind of a conflict is hardly surprising at all. And so the, these novels explore that distinction or that parallel and that mirror image of Catholicism and communism, as well as Cold War mirror images of different kinds of revolutionary states. You know, that here we have the birthplace of a Vietnamese revolution, but they, you know, we Vietnamese people, you know, whatever you think of, whatever your political stance is, factually, we were colonized by the French who had their own democratic revolution. And then the Americans came in and told us what to do, and they had their own democratic revolution. So what, the, I mean, all of those kinds of contradictions and hypocrisies are things that fascinate me and animate these novels. Yeah. Um, that idea of uh, hypocrisy and sort of the juxtaposition and parallels between Catholicism and communism take a different turn towards the end of the committed, and there's a different kind of um, idea that, that, that captures the narrator, and that's the idea of nothing, right? It, uh, for the audience, it comes up many times for the narrator as an alternative to action, as a path to peace, as a different kind of conscious choice, and ultimately as something that is sacred. Um, I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about why nothing and all of the wordplay and political play around that term becomes such a crucial idea for you to examine and to complicate in the committed. Well, you know, um, in writing these novels, part of the fun of writing these novels is just to have fun with the language. Uh, the novels are about plot and narrative and politics and, and all, all that kind of stuff, but they're also really about language as well. And, um, you know, I, when I came here to the United States, uh, I was four years old and I was fluent in Vietnamese Right. And now all these decades later, I'm still fluent in Vietnamese at a four-year-old level. Okay. <laughs> but nevertheless, having that much capacity in Vietnamese means I think that uh, I can see the English language from the outside as well as the inside. Um, I'm very fluent in English, but I also, in writing these novels, try to look at the English language from the outside as well. And what that meant is that there's a lot of wordplay taking place in these novels, you know, words with multiple meanings, jokes, that kind of stuff. And at the political level, the novel is deeply concerned with the multiple meanings that attach to one idea. That's what we call a contradiction. So here we have one contradiction is the American Revolution. Hey, we liberated, we liberated ourselves, and now in the name of freedom, we're taking away the freedom of other people. That's one way to read it. Um, and so nothing is like that. Nothing is a word that is easy to read as having only one meaning. But in fact, I think nothing has multiple meanings. And that even when, when we say nothing, typically we, we think there's nothing there. But in fact, nothing can be something. Nothing can be a presence. Um, and so when some people read the end of The Sympathizer, and it's, there's a lot of nothing, as you say, yeah. they come away thinking, God, this is such a nihilistic ending. I'm like, well, no, you missed the whole point of the novel. It's not a nihilistic ending at all. It's, it's, a, it's an ending in which we get to see the duality of nothing without me giving away the end of the story. In fact, nothing has two meanings at the end. And to me, that, that totally fits in with the politics and the language play of the book, that everything has multiple meanings, contradictory meanings, and there's no way out. I think as human beings, we want simple solutions. 
we want a, we want a way out and these novels are about contradictions that have no way out yeah. or if they do they just insert us if we get out of one contradiction we just get plugged into another contradiction that's why there's a sequel yeah. and that's why there will be a third and final third and final novel no more you know uh and so in the committed I wanted to continue exploring nothing. That's one of the things that happens yeah. because I, at the end of the novel, the sympathizer actually did not understand what I was doing. I mean, I said, yes, nothing has duality of meaning, but what does that really mean? And some people would say, is this a Buddhist thing? Are you, are you, are you engaged in a Buddhist meditation? I'm like, yeah, not really. But I said, yes, I am, of course. <laughs> so in the, there is some of that happening. I think there will be more of that discussion of nothing in terms of other cultural context. But what also happens in the sympathizer is um, he, he, he does, nothing at a key moment when he should have done something and in the committed too aha uh -huh. yes but if you read to the end of the committed yeah. there's a reversal right okay and so that that there's a juxtaposition between these two key actions that they happen at the end of these two novels that test his morality his ethics his conscience his politics and and they revolve around nothing and what to do with nothing yeah. um nothing to your point about a contradiction leading into another contradiction, right? Nothing leads us directly at the end of the novel. I won't give anything away, but it also leads the narrator into another contradiction and another possibility of the place of nonviolence, right? And he starts to link these two. If I could, I'm just gonna read a couple of lines. Um, nonviolence could detoxify us and free us from our inferiority complexes, lift us from despair and fear, and restore the self-respect we need for action. Nonviolence could break the mirror altogether and liberate us from the need to see ourselves in the eyes of our oppressors, forcing us into the disturbing space of the negative, the nothing, the blank, the void, where we must create ourselves anew. And that's the point at which he begins to ask, and he doesn't provide an answer of whether nonviolence is the next necessary possibility. And I'm curious if you felt the narrator had to arrive at even considering that possibility precisely because he had already experienced and perpetuated such significant and traumatic violence. Is that the necessary outcome or at least the possibility of what has to happen next? I hope so, you know, because the sympathizer is motivated by the question, what is to be done? revolutionaries are motivated by that question and they're motivated by, motivated by that question i think out of love and empathy they look around and they they look at their countries and they realize people are being oppressed and people are poor and and they and something has to be done to help these people to free these people in the name of the revolution and then of course we look at the revolutions that have happened and then yeah. they've they've, they've typically been very very violent right and the consequences have been violent so colonization or other forms of domination are violent and then they they, they generate these you know these antagonistic forms of violence and the outcome is obviously sometimes good in the sense that countries are liberated people are liberated but then also the consequences are oftentimes very terrible because you know we see that violence when you commit violence as an individual or as a collective you 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 do destroy something within yourself. You destroy your own ideals. You destroy your own morality. And uh, I think we can look at probably every country that has had a revolution and see that the ramifications of revolutions are oftentimes the betrayal of ideals, right? And if we don't see that, it's because we've erased that. Um, so if, obviously, if you win a revolution, I'm sorry, win a revolution, one of the first things you want to do is to control the narrative of that revolution and erase all of the betrayals that your own side may have done. Our narrator can't forget the betrayals and the failures and everything like that. And so, you know, the committed is about him then trying to figure out, well, what else is to be done? We already tried, I tried violence already and it's been horrible. So let's try nonviolence. Um, because if, if we say that violence can free us and liberate us and detoxify us, and these, this, that comes from France Fanon's right. um, black skin, white masks. What if we just, doesn't nonviolence, can it do the same thing? So let's give nonviolence a chance. Um, we only get that chance at the very end of the committed. So that's why there has to be a third book to see, well, what happens after that? And I can guarantee you, I'm pretty sure it's not going to be Kumbaya, okay? Because yeah. like one contradiction leads to another contradiction. Now, what that is, I haven't figured it out, but there will be efforts for nonviolence, but there also, in the novel takes place, uh, the third novel takes place in the second half of the 1980s in the United States and, and Latin America, I think. Uh, and if you, <laughs> well, he starts off in Latin America, which, oh, Central America. Okay, so basically the Vietnam War 
the Vietnam War ends, quote unquote, I don't think it really did, but in 1975, and then what did the United States do? It just continued the war in Central America. And you took all the same tactics, all the same politics, all this domino theory kind of stuff and supporting you know, autocratic, terrible regimes in Central America. And our narrator is gonna go back to America, broadly speaking, through Central America, then to the United States. But remember the second half of the 1980s in the United States was Star Wars, it was culture wars. I mean, it was all these things that actually totally foreshadow the moment that we're living in today. Um, you know, you, you mentioned a couple of minutes ago that process of you've won the revolution, you've won the war, now we must control the narrative, right? And you've spoken and written elsewhere about the memory industry and the ways in which Hollywood and political rhetoric performs and constructs that narrative. Is satire, we've, the committed is absolutely, as you've said, thriller, spy, um, crime novel, but it's also satire and no one escapes being satirized in this novel. Do you see satire as the necessary counter to that process of erasure and of, of reconstructing what the memory industry is doing, especially with war and revolution and its aftermath? Well, you know, what happens with, with revolutions or any form of power is that they, the people who do these things can't laugh at themselves, you know, because they have the power and people who are powerful tend to not want to be mocked because anybody can look around and see that the powerful uh, tend to be corrupted, tend to be hypocritical, tend to be absurd. And this is not, there's no, no society, no ideology has, has ownership over that. It happens everywhere. Right. And so satire becomes a very important you know, tool of personal survival, but also of political critique as well. And it's very powerful because it can make us laugh. And, you know, and, uh, and by laughing, we can, uh, we can uh, not, not only just see the absurdity of things, but we, we, by laughing, we also absorb a very, uh, absorb very important political points that we may not be able to accept if we were not laughing. So if I were just to stand up in front of you and just lecture you about colonialism and stuff, you know, most of you would just turn off for a very good reason. But if I can make you laugh, you might be able to listen to what's being said. And hopefully, hopefully that's what happens in, in, this, in the, uh, the committed and the sympathizer. And by the way, um, the French are mocked, but the Vietnamese are also mocked as well. I mean, the, my first exposure to hypocrisy and absurdity was within the Vietnamese community, and they, they get their comeuppance in this book. I was going to say, uh, the um, liberal intellectual leftist circle of the aunt and her community is as satirized as every other component in the novel, right? Yeah, I mean, if you read The Sympathizer, you think, well, yeah, Viet has a lot of satirical things to say about Republicans and right-wingers and the military-industrial complex. Yes, in this book, the communist, the Marxist, the leftist, they get their turn. Yeah. Um, I'm wondering if we can switch gears and talk a little bit about the protagonist, but maybe the place of the protagonist's voice in the memoir that you're currently working on. You've spoken about the protagonist is a kind of exaggerated, dramatized alter ego, able to say the things perhaps that you can't always articulate um, in real life. I'm curious about to what extent the narrator's voice is with you or influencing you or interjecting in this current process of writing the memoir. A nonfiction book with a lot of memoiristic elements and stuff, yeah. And, um... The tentative title now, I'm not sure we're going to stick with it, is A Man of Two Faces. Um, uh, and, you know, if you read The Sympathizer, if you read the first line of The Sympathizer, it's A Man of Two Faces, okay? And when I, and, you know, in, in reality, I think that is me as well. Um, you know, when I was growing up, I felt like my, my parents were telling me all the time, you are 100% Vietnamese. And so when I was outside in American society, I felt like I was a Vietnamese person spying on Americans. But then in my parents' household, I felt like I was an American spying on them. Very common immigrant, refugee, so-called minority experience of any kind. And so I just took that feeling and I blew it up in The Sympathizer. And writing The Sympathizer was very liberating for me because, as I said, I, I'm deeply repressed. And um, like, for example, like none of my friends who knew, have known me for a long time would have ever have said, Viet is a funny guy. No, <laughs> Viet is a very serious guy. But creating the alter ego of The Sympathizer allowed me, as you said, to just give voice to all these inner things that have been you know boiling up inside of me for a long time and it was very liberating and in liberating myself in writing the novel i think i also liberated myself in writing hopefully this nonfiction slash memoir kind of book and so it's it's not uh <laughs> the voice is still different i think than the sympathizer but there is that element of, of self-recognition of these two faces uh and of these contradictions that are within myself um maybe one last question before we turn to audience questions you'd mentioned when we were talking before the event um, that perhaps you tell us a little bit about why you didn't read 
from that work in progress today in Harrisburg as you return to this place um, at this moment? Did you want to talk a little bit about that? Well, sure. I mean, um, as you might imagine, Harrisburg doesn't get off easy in the memoir, um, but neither does San Jose. I went from Harrisburg to San Jose in 1978. And so, you know, those lines in the, in, the, in the nonfiction book where I say, thank God we moved to San Jose. Okay. But then in San Jose, I mean, this, the only thing San Jose was known for back then was, do you know the way to San Jose? That song by Dionne Warwick. It's a crappy song. Even Dionne Warwick said it's not a very good song. I mean, it was a very popular song and won a Grammy. It was like a huge global hit, but it, was, it really sucked, you know? And uh, so, but, you know, with Harrisburg, uh, I, I honestly put Harrisburg behind me for a very long time. Because like I said, it was like, it was kind of traumatic, uh, you know, my initiation into Harrisburg in terms of being, uh, no, no, I didn't mention that, right? Oh, so what happened was, you know, we settled in Fort Indian Town Gap, which I'm going to visit for the first time tomorrow and get, get a tour. Um, and then uh, I think there were about 22,000 of us there. And in order to leave one of these refugee camps or four in the country, you had to have an American sponsor you. But there wasn't an, uh, an American willing to sponsor all four of us. So one sponsor took my parents, one sponsor took my 10-year-old brother, one sponsor took four-year-old me. And that's where my memories begin, howling and screaming as I'm being taken away my, from my parents. So it's kind of traumatic. So I wanted to put Harrisburg behind me. Um, but then as you know, uh, my editor suggested, hey, why don't you write this nonfiction book? I said, fine, I'll do it. And then it turned into a memoir. And that, meant, that means I had to go back and sort of think about the things I didn't want to think about, including Harrisburg. And number of complications. Number one, why is it called Fort Indian Town Gap? I was like, huh. Like I, for my entire life, I never thought about it. And then I thought, oh, it's probably because they killed Indians here, you know? And, but if you read the, the booster site and the Fort Indian Town Gap site, it's like, it was, it was built here to defend the settlers against the Indians, you know? Um, that's one of version course. of history. Yeah. <laughs> um, so we talk about that. But then um, in the section that I thought I was going to read, I went back and I looked at it a couple of nights ago and I thought, I can't read this out loud because it integrates my meditations about my thinking about Harrisburg with what Richard Pryor thought about Vietnamese refugees. So Richard Pryor, you can find this on YouTube and online, um, on audio recording. Richard Pryor actually had actually talked about Vietnamese refugees in 1975. And if you know anything about Richard Pryor, he's uncensored. So a lot of things he had to say were absolutely right. Hey, you know, like here are the new, you know what's, and they've come to, to take our jobs and the black people's jobs. And, and uh, they're, you know, white people now all of a sudden want to adopt these orphans from Vietnam, but they don't want to adopt black orphans and so on and so forth. And he's absolutely right. There's a very, very powerful political critique couched in a lot of obscenities and words that I can't say out loud. So, you know, hopefully, if and when I finish this book, and if and when we do an audio version of this book, it'll be me talking, and then it'll be Richard Pryor himself yeah. saying what only Richard Pryor himself can say. Great. Thank you. I think we're going to turn it over for audience yeah. questions. Can we just give a quick round of applause for Viet and Sheila Jane? <laughs> if you have a question, please raise your hand, and I will come around with the mic. Yes. Hey, hey, just a quick question. I used to, uh, I met a woman who used to be a teacher <clears throat> at Indian Town Gap when um, the people came in in 1975 and she mentioned to me one day, I, I've been living in Saigon, so we came back and we were chatting two years ago and she said the biggest problem they had in Indian Town Gap, they had unheated barracks and they had all the kids trying to go to school every day and teach English and all that stuff which, you know, you would know about. And she said the biggest problem we had was keeping the Vietnamese kids away from the Cambodian kids. They were constantly fighting. Were you one of those kids? Do you remember that? Well, I, I remember the barracks, actually. And the, uh, the only memory I have of the barracks is that I don't remember if the kid was Cambodian or not, but, you know, I was not a very smart kid. So I was four years old, and, and this, this one kid was like, hey, uh, he, he, he asked me to charge at him. He was holding a chair or something. And then I charged at him, and then he pulled like a, like a bullfighter, he pulled it out of the way and then I crashed into this other, these other chairs and I helped my mom and all of that. So no, I was too young at four years of age to participate in the fights that you're talking about. But I moved to San Jose in 1978 and in the second grade, um, the, my elementary school was basically all Mexican and all Vietnamese from my memories, right? And in the second grade, we Vietnamese kids already formed gangs, literally. I mean, and then we were fighting in the schoolyard. Now, me being a coward, I didn't fight personally. <laughs> I stayed behind my, the front line of my gang. You know, but the point is, I can totally see that happening. And between Vietnamese and Cambodians is very interesting. Uh, because one of the things I talk about in the nonfiction book is that you know, uh, 
growing up as a Vietnamese person in San Jose, the people we were most afraid of initially were the police. My parents had never called the police because in, in, in Saigon or, or Vietnam, the police were the people who came and took bribes from you, right? Don't trust the police and then don't trust Vietnamese people because the Vietnamese people are the ones who are going to come in and invade your house and you know, torture you for your money and everything like that. Uh, and so that's bad, obviously bad. But where did these youngsters, because they're all young, learn this violence from? Did this come from nowhere? I think it came from being traumatized by war, by seeing their fathers and brothers and uncles come back and be messed up. And, you know, Vietnamese are not good at therapy, okay? We just take out our trauma on each other, and we don't even call it trauma, you know? And so all these, these gangs, this violence, all this kind of stuff, I totally believe they're ripple effects from the fact that the war never ended. Hi. Uh, so I'm a humanitarian aid worker, and we're talking a lot about decolonization. Um, do you think that uh, there's anything left after decolonization, or is it kind of what came before colonization? Is that still there, intact? And if so, what is that? What does that look like? Awesome question. I'll write a book about that one day. Um, but no, I don't know what comes after decolonization. I think, in fact, it's going to be really, really hard just to decolonize. Right now, we're at the rhetorical stage of decolonization, and we have the ideas about decolonization, and it's a lot easier to do things like to decolonize our syllabi, for example, which is why CRT is a big deal, you know, because, in fact, I think the right wing does implicitly understand, they, they don't understand what critical race theory is, but they turn it into a symbol of decolonization. They don't say decolonization either, but they understand that ideas are partly where decolonization takes place, right? And that is where uh, people like me, my ilk, have had the most success in the culture wars is in transforming canons and syllabi and reading lists and college curricula and school, high school curricula. And that is so threatening that we're seeing this enormous pushback. Now, beyond that, beyond just textual decolonization and ideas, we're talking about things like decolonizing institutions. For me, colon what colonization means, if, here we're talking about just the United States, colonization is genocide, it's occupation, it's warfare, it's enslavement, it's all of these things that are as American as democracy and freedom. And when, when, when I say contradiction, this is what I mean. You can't talk about America simply, the United States of America simply as democracy and freedom. You have to acknowledge that this country is built on blood. Can you do that? And to decolonize then therefore means to start from there, but then to think about how genocide and occupation, enslavement, war, these are not things of the past. They're embedded in the present. We're, we're on native land, right? The very things that people who are middle class or white or, or people like me take for granted, the capacity to have a mortgage, to be able to buy a house in a certain area, to not be threatened by the police. This is not just racial. This is a consequence of colonization that we're still with, that's still with us today. And so decolonization means to get rid of all of those structural realities it means to give the land back i don't know when we're going to get to that point you know, there's so much more work that needs to, be, to, to happen and and the initial step is to recognize that the united states is in fact a settler colonial country and that we cannot deflect colonization onto europeans for example americans like to say we never did that here we're exceptional uh we're the country of the american dream well in fact colonization does exist in this country except we don't call it by that name we call it the american dream could I just add a quick, um, a quick comment that I think extends and builds on what Viet has said here? We also have examples while, while there is so far left to go. If you look at what Native peoples and Native communities have done in terms of resurgence and what the scholar Gerald Visner has called survivance, if you look at Native Hawaiians who have revived a language and hula and art forms and religious forms that were banned and nearly eradicated. If you look at what native writers from very many different native nations have done to build language and literature and an entire field of native and indigenous studies, the work is not over. But I think those are models for what resurgence looks like in the midst of, and also I think beyond decolonization. It's not a return to some immobilized, frozen, authentic past. It is a revival and a resurgence that is multifaceted, that is 
modern, that is ancient, that is oral, that is written, that is intellectual, and that is performed. And I think we need to turn to and listen and watch Native leaders across all sectors, in the business world, in environmental sciences, in the arts, in the humanities, who are living that decolonization project each and every day across numerous industries. And we have to see that that resurgence is the work of decolonization and it is ongoing and it is present. So I just wanna offer that as a kind of extension as well in response to that question. Question in the back. All right, you might not like this question, but um, what would you do if you were dictator of America in order to reverse this? Uh, you know, if you had free will to instill your version of social utopia, what actions would you take? You're the devil. This is what the devil does. The devil says, hey, uh, uh, this is what the devil does. Right? You can have all this land yeah, and all these people. Yeah. Oh, what would I do? You know, I, I would, I would, since I'm a dictator and have all, pa all I'm all powerful, you know, um, I would institute radical democracy. I mean, that would be the first step because again, you know, part of the point of these books, but you know, is, is that, you know, absolute power corrupts. And if you believe in democracy, you actually believe in people having the power, not representatives necessarily and all of that. Um, so that would be the, the first step. Uh, for me. Thank you so much. Um, I am half Japanese and half American. So this book really, it was the last line really, I, I, I felt we will live meant you provided so, an Af, uh, Asian American that will never die, right? Like a, a history, a literature. So I just wanted to thank you for that. Um, my question is, I, I, I'm just curious to keep this conversation going because in my opinion, as an educator, I think the issue starts with our education. I grew up here, around here. Um, well, I was, my dad was in the military, so we were in Germany in different military bases. Um, but then this was where we settled. And I, not in Harrisburg, but in the, in the rural areas. And I don't know if anyone went to school in the rural areas. And if there are any other Asian Americans, this story hasn't really been told either, right? Because you're being told... Um, I've been told really horrific things, right? And they're normalized in the public institution. So when we t talk about decolonization, I love it, right? Bring it on. But what are some kind of practical, logistical things that we can kind of push our communities, our public education system? Um, I've taught substituting. I've taught in every level of education. I teach college now. Um, so, you know, what, what can we do? Because just one statistic, and then I'll, I'll actually let you answer the question. Um, but one statistic I just found is that 75% of history teachers are white in America. This statistic hasn't changed. So when you hear your, your like kids saying, oh, my history teachers are different, they might be different, but this demographic is still just shuffling around people of color to represent an America that isn't, right? That we don't hear that history. So I guess that's kind of the, the direction I'm going. And, yeah, and, and you know, Sheila, you chip in as well, since you gave such a spirited um, uh, argument just recently. Well, to take on that, that this from the angle of colonization and decolonization, colonization is a totalizing system, right? It, it, it occupies everything. And so when we're engaged in decolonization, what we're talking about is also a totalizing effort as well. That's why, you know, for example, when we, th when we think about education, since you're an educator and there's various kinds of educational programs out there and stuff, I think, well, you can't actually heal the problems of society only through education because the problems of society are pervasive. So let's say that even if we did such a thing in this rural area, hypothetical rural area, and you found sympathetic teachers and administrators who are willing to do things like diversify the curriculum and include you know, histories that reconsider the whole nature of this country, et cetera, and then represent all these peoples and everything, but you still have high rates of poverty, let's say. Well, the if the student is coming to school and is hungry and has other issues going on at home, et cetera, are they what are they gonna get? out of this education, they may, they may get something better because there's a more diverse curriculum, but they still have all these other issues to contend with. So there's that. But even getting the, the diverse curriculum is already challenging enough as we talked about. Now with the, the high school teachers being 75% white, I mean, this is like true for every industry, I think. Like my, I'm in the publishing industry and we have the same issue. Right now, the publishing industry, you look around at these tables, there's a huge emphasis on multicultural literatures. Like people know that they should have black writers and Asian writers and you know, our kids should be reading diverse kids literature and all that kind of stuff. But then the publishing industry is like 87% white, right? Um, and this is simply symbolic of the problem 
in this country about structural inequalities, that you can have the rhetoric about diversity, equity, inclusion, and you have all the proper faces and everything like that, but the power structure is still dominated by, by white people. And so in order to address your question, I, there's no easy answer. Like, I just can't like do one thing. You know, you actually have to change the, all, all of these opportunities so that you could have a system in which poor kids of color could imagine that they could be teachers and find a way to get there. Now, if you ask me as the dictator of America, what would I do? I would say, hey, you know, like obviously cut the Pentagon budget in half. You know, a cruise missile could radically transform a rural school district. I mean, the cost of a cruise missile, right? Uh, you know, have, have free universal health care, have free pre-K through college, uh, you know, um, abolish the prison industrial complex, abolish the fact that what, what that means also is that, you know, poor kids get tracked into prison, right? I just listened to this incredible podcast, Suave. It was a final, it won the Pulitzer Prize. I'm on the Pulitzer board. And Suave is, and just I'll end with this one story, you know, Suave is Luis Suave Gonzalez. He ends up in prison in, in Pennsylvania for a murder he did not commit. But he said, you know, that he already had been in prison as a teenager before this murder, and he had been in school. And he said, well, you know, school already got us ready for prison. You go to school, you have to go through metal detectors, you're already treated as a potential criminal. And then you think, well, going to prison can't be that bad. And then you go to prison as a, as a kid, and then, then you're like, oh, well, then why not do more stuff? So, I mean, all these things are interrelated, right? Um, so I'm sorry, I can't give you an, an easy answer to the, the problem that you raised. Well, I think the the protagonist of the committed gives us an answer, right? To your point about overhauling the system, you're only able to overhaul the system if you genuinely believe that nothing is sacred and that these, these systems can be radically reimagined. Um, you're, you're a better advocate than I am. Thank you. <laughs> uh, we have nothing time. is sacred and everything is connected. Yeah. We have time for just one more question. Um, uh, oh, okay. All right, it's on. Yeah, so um, uh, I think this goes well with the last question that was asked. And so I'm wondering, uh, what are your opinions on anarchism and the incorporation of like anarchist ideology into um, as a way to like remedy the potential totalitarian aspects of revolution? Because I noticed that you uh, t touch on and satirize a lot of that in the committed. I satirize what in the committed? Um, like the totalitarian aspects of a lot of. Oh. Sorry, totalitarian aspects of a lot of like so-called communist revolutions. Yeah, I mean, there's a deep skepticism eventually in these books, I think, about the state. Like, so even if you even have a, a, a revolution, if the point is to capture the state, but the state itself is structured with inequality and the abuse of power and, and corruption and all these kinds of things, maybe, you know, the stateless society is the place to go. Um, so yes, eventually, hopefully, we, we, get, we get to go there. Um, I think there's going to be gestures at that in the third and final novel of the Sympathizer trilogy. I mean, in reality, obviously, history continues on past the 1980s. We don't get the genuine revolution, blah, blah, blah. But in the dialectic through which the Sympathizer himself lives, he's gone from, you know, communist revolution and the capture of the state and the Sympathizer, and then he sees the terrible consequences of that. And then in the committed, he's going through this, uh, these efforts to, be, to understand what nonviolence might mean. And I think in the final installment, he is going to engage with anarchy and statelessness and these, these possibilities that go beyond uh, what uh, the revolutions that he's lived through have envisioned. I don't think it's an either or, is it? Yeah. <laughs> community action yeah if I, if I had to pick one but the, these books are partly about refusing either or binaristic <laughs> choices yeah <laughs> okay thank you all right we've got to wrap up can we give it one more round of applause for Viet and Sue Tang? all right couple quick things. Uh, we're going to have a book signing right here. We have many, many copies of Viet's book uh, up at the cafe. We've got The Committed, The Sympathizer, uh, the children's book. Uh, we've got The Refugees. So we've got a lot of books if you want to get multiple books to get signed. Um, one last plug. Next Friday, May 20th, is a Harrisburg's first ever AAPI Heritage Month celebration. We're starting at the market at 530. Then we're coming over here at 7 for an event uh, with an author. And then we're going over to the cinema for a, a film screening. So we'd love to see you there. We've got flyers up there, but check out our website, midtownscholar.com. Um, 
I think that's it. Thanks, everyone. Have a good night. Yeah. Open those cans.